Adam, we're so happy you are back. And you know what? It just has been a while. I think our last <laughs> conversation was a few years back. And our kids been, are a little bit older. Yes. I think it's been four <laughs> years. Actually, I, I feel 14 years older now, but. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly how you feel. Uh, so, well, let's. Um, Let's uh, uh, talk about a little bit something interesting about you because um, maybe some of our listeners or uh, audience, they, they, they don't know about you. So tell us something interesting about yourself. Well, the basic facts, I guess, are that I, I grew up in the U.S. Um, and 20 some years ago now, I came to Japan, not intending to stay for quite so long. Um, but I met my wife-to-be, and we settled here, and we live in Hiroshima, Japan. And my daughter is now, our daughter, I should say, is now 16, and our son is 13, and our bearded dragon is one year old. And the bearded dragon has kind of taken over our lives as a family and become the most popular member of the family, in fact. So... Perhaps, at least recently, that's the most interesting thing about me. Wow, the, the dragon. Where, where did you find it? Or did, where did you, you know, have, have this, um, you know, little pad? It's just one year old. Usually, you talk about pad, you know, when the kids were a little bit, uh, you know, younger. And then I think this precious uh, um, dragon, can you talk about it? Well, uh, let's see. Well, I well, want to show this first. Yes. Are yes. you talking about so, this one? Yes, exactly. Bearded dragon. Yes, the bearded dragon. Um, her name is FIFA because FIFA. my son loves soccer, so it's a connection. Ah. To soccer, but um, anyway, FIFA turned out to be a really good name for this very sweet and gentle creature. And I don't know how many people out there are familiar with bearded dragons, but apparently they've become more and more popular over the past 10, 20 years. And the reason is they're very sweet and very gentle and they love to be held. And, um, you know, in the evening we'll sit in front of the TV, for example, and holding FIFA and she's watching TV with us. And she's just a very, very, sweet and cute creature. So anyway, uh, we'll talk more about the coloring book in a minute, uh, but my, my kids wanted a pet, particularly my son, and we hadn't had pets for a while. We did have, once upon a time, we had some uh, uh, hermit crabs, mm. and that was kind of interesting. Uh, we never had a larger pet, um, but anyway, we got to the point where I was thinking, yes, I would like a pet too. Let's, let's get a family pet, um, but what should it be? And so anyway, I was doing some research and, and came across the idea of a bearded dragon and people kept saying, and if you, look, if you've never had experience with a bearded dragon, you just don't know how lovable they are. They're really quite incredible creatures. And so at the time, of course, we, hadn't, I, I, we didn't have uh, our little dragon yet. And so I didn't know that, but uh, I was hearing from others uh, what, a, what a nice little creature this is. And so anyway, as it turns out, uh, there is a reptile shop in Hiroshima, which I was very surprised. I mean, there are pet shops, um, but there's a reptile shop. And I thought, well, that would be the place to go. And we did go there last year, um, early in the spring, I guess. And FIFA was still very small. And I was concerned that would we really be able to keep her alive <laughs> while she's so small and delicate. So we left her there for another few weeks with the, you know, the experts at the uh, reptile shop. And then we brought her home. She was very small. She's not that big now. I mean, she'll fit in your hand, but she has a very long tail. Okay, so she's, I don't remember, 40 centimeters long or something like that. So she's not terribly big, and as bearded dragons go, she's actually on the smaller side. But anyway, that's the story of how she came to live with us and then kind of take over our lives, but in, in a really joyful way. And it's also led to, you know, creative work with my son, um, creating this coloring book uh, entirely in our target language as well. So it, 
it all comes back to language eventually. And even with the bearded dragon, who is completely silent, by the way, she yes. never makes a sound. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, not only can she not talk, but she, they don't make sounds at all, really. I mean, maybe when she was a baby, she hissed just a little bit at me before she you know, became comfortable with us. But they're completely silent. And um, so anyway, maybe that's another um, positive aspect of a bearded dragon. Absolutely. <laughs> they're not a terribly noisy pet to have around. How interesting. This uh, just reminds me of what the chame chameleons we, we had for, for a short period of time. Oh. Yeah, we also love um, reptiles. And then, uh, yeah, so it's kind of interesting. But this is very lovable. I mean, I, I read a book and then I thought that was so cute. And I will talk about that in a little while. Yeah. Um, so, well, since you know, it has been a while since we last talked four years ago. So what has changed in the bilingual parenting journey? Sure. And, and Amanda, your kids are roughly the same age, right? Yes. Yes. What are they? Just remind me of. Right. My son is 16 years old. My daughter is 14. Yeah, it's almost the same. Right. So my daughter is 16 and my son is 13. And four years, a lot has happened. I would say the, the main transition is that my own influence on their lives uh, and on their language learning, their language development, um, has really shrunk over that time. They're very busy with their own lives. My daughter is now in high school. My son is in his second year of junior high, and he'll be in high school uh, the year after next. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're busy with school. They're busy with after-school activities on their... Uh, sports teams. They're very busy with mounds of uh, homework from school. And when they do have a little free time, they're busy with their own friends. And so they're, you know, the opportunities to spend quality time with daddy uh, have really reduced. Uh, they've really decreased uh, over the past four years since we, we last spoke. Um, I still find time, of course, to spend with them when I can, and I try to be proactive about that. I think it's easier to do that with my son for a couple of different reasons. He's still a bit younger and has a bit more time. Mm -hmm. And we can also, you know, we worked on this coloring book together. We can do certain projects together that my daughter not only does not have the time for, but she, uh, I'm not sure she would have the same interest in, you know, taking part in these kinds of activities. However, she's on the tennis team now, so I'm trying to play tennis with her and things like that. But really, um, and this is something, I wrote a blog post the other day about this. Yes. Uh, and what I urge parents is that, you know, make the most of the time you have when your children are younger, because that is when you can spend more time with them and you, you have, more influence on their lives and their language development. And so you, if you make the most of those younger years, then you'll be in a much better position when your children get older, like, like mine, like yours. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a really important, um, it's not necessarily a secret, but let's call it a secret, to success, to longer term success, is to really be mindful and proactive early on and exert as much playful influence as you can uh, on your children's lives and their language development from early on. And, you know, do what you can as your children get older, but realistically speaking, it becomes more and more difficult uh, to exert the same kind of influence once they become teenagers. I think I experienced the same thing. My kids have been really busy and then, you know, they are much bigger now. And then a lot of time they have their own things, you know, to do. So for me, there are only a few things, you know, when they have a project, you know, if I can encourage right. them to do projects with me, then, right. you know, that'll be a very different story. So it's very interesting. We're all using the projects as a, a way to you know, connect with kids. And what we have always been connecting, but the things like right. do further, you know, do something more in the target language. So I agree. I agree. Projects. I think that's a very good point 
I mean, projects related, they may not necessarily be related to school necessarily, like this coloring book project just was inspired by our bearded dragon, right? And the fact that we had a lot of time at home together in the spring because the schools were closed for nearly three months because of the pandemic, um, which was actually um, a silver lining in this, in this very dark cloud this year. Um, but projects are important. And with my daughter, she is now in a high school program that emphasizes English, which is our target language. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of hoping for even more emphasis on English. So that would help me um, more, but, but still it's, it is helpful. And there are certain things related to her program or you know, things related to English like last year, her last year of junior high, she was in a English speech contest, for example. We spend a lot of time together um, preparing for that, writing the draft of her speech, and then preparing for her presentation. So there are opportunities, um, whether they're related to school in some way or not. But uh, again, I think as our kids get older, um, we do need to be continue to be proactive about the day-to-day -day efforts, but also these special projects, which can include even more time together and more engagement in the language, right? No, absolutely. I totally agree. I, I think, you know, for our kids, I think it's, we are at a stage that, you know, they will not um, forget the target language, I have right. to say, you know, they can speak, right. they can read. So, um, so while your kids also, they write. So, so I think, you know, at this age, I think they're teenagers now. So it's kind of like, it's a different way to maintain the language also advance. So for example, for my kids, you know, um, my son is very interested in um, current events. So a lot of times okay. our conversation will involve the current events and then we will use the target language to talk about a certain thing. So this is a little bit more advanced kind of conversation. And I think, you know, uh, not just grow the language, but also to maintain the language and keep growing the language, you have to keep doing that. Right. I mean, I, I think you made a good point um, in that, you know, when we get to this place, and if we have been very mindful, very proactive up to this point, then hopefully I think our kids will be at a place where uh, that the language has a strong and active foundation. So we don't necessarily need to be concerned about um, you know, the sustainability mm -hmm. of their language ability, right? And yet at the same time, of course, we want to continue um, you know, uh, cultivating their interest and their language development to the extent we can, up to the point, I guess, they run screaming from our home once they <laughs> enter college or something like that. But, you know, I have gotten to the point, I think more and more now, where it's not only, and every parent faces this eventually, whether they're raising a bilingual child or not, but they get to the point where they um, have to let go of their children because of course their children need to become independent adults on their own. So we let go of them as parents and children. But I think also with raising a bilingual or multilingual child, you get to the point where you also have to let go as language learners. So they are, they've gotten to the point where they, they have this ability and you know there will come a point you know, even more so in the future where I will, you know, sit back and maybe lie down in my hammock finally and say, you know, it's up to them. You know, it's their life to live, not only as an adult, but also uh, with this language and what they choose to do with it will finally be up to them. I will continue to encourage it. And if they have children of their own, I would of course encourage them to hand it down to their children. And if I'm still around at that point, then I'll do what I can by reading with my own grandchildren, things like that. But I do think we get to a point where we have to start letting go, both as simply a parent, but also as their language model or their language uh, police or however you wanna phrase it. But then it's really, up to them. It's their life to live 
uh, you know, apart from the language, but also with the language itself. And, you know, we've gotten to the point where we could say, ah, we've done what we can and, you know, and, and feel that we've, we've done the best we can and what we have done is good enough for the rest of their lives as they choose to live them out. That, that, is, uh, that's, that is beautiful. I, I think that is so important because I think while raising bilingual kids, I think at one point it just becomes a part of your everyday life. It, is, it becomes a lifestyle. So your yeah. family's lifestyle is, well, we have two languages or three languages and right. that's our lifestyle. So as the kids you know, grow up and I think at the same time, they they are going to define who they are and what they're going to do with the languages. I, I, I wrote something a while back. I say, well, actually, there's an expiration date for this raising bilingual child, <laughs> because when they when they uh, go to college, you just mentioned that, then, you know, it's like I am all no longer be there and they just need to take the languages they have and grow from there on their own. And it's very interesting. Right, right, right. Well, it's the whole empty nest thing. And um, again, I think it happens much more quickly than you expect. And I think, you know, again, we can go back to our conversation four years ago, and we weren't discussing these issues at the time. And we probably really, maybe intellectually, we could have talked about it, but we wouldn't understand them emotionally or you know, in a lived way, in a, in a heartfelt way. And I think we can now. And I think maybe one important thing to underscore for parents with younger children is that you will get to this point more quickly than you expect. And what that means is do whatever you can now without being frantic about it, you know, continue to be playful from day to day, but make the most of your days because you will get to this point um, pretty quickly where you will have to start letting go and the empty nest will be on the horizon. And at that point, I mean, what we're doing, I guess I wrote about this the other, the other day, but the metaphor, I suppose, is something like, you know, we're not only preparing our children to fly away, but we're preparing them to sing with these languages. And ultimately, it will be up to them to fly away and to continue singing on their own. And we may continue, you know, squawking in the background for a while, but, you know, ultimately, we won't be around that much or eventually even at all. So it's really their life to live. And then beyond that, the, the lives of, you know, any descendants that um, may develop beyond them. Yeah, carry on. So, well, I remember in our last conversation four years ago, we were actually having a great time. We we're talking about, oh, it's a stuffed animals, you know, we were doing different kinds of things, you know, and to, to have fun with the kids. So playful is so important, even yeah. now, right? Even though we don't have a lot of time with them. But, you know, I think you probably went, I think I saw a picture, you took them to uh, zip lining, I believe. Oh, that's right. We did during the um, the pandemic when things started calming down here a bit more and, you know, certain things were opening up again. And we went to this place called uh, Forest Adventure, mm. which apparently started in France. And I guess it's become more popular in other places. But what it is, is, I mean, you're moving from these are very tall trees in the forest. And you have to move from tree to tree, not just zip lining, that's part of it. But you know, doing all these other, it's like an obstacle course high in the trees. And I'm kind of afraid of heights. And, and I didn't even know that I was going to have to be a part of it, honestly, <laughs> because we were signing them up. And then they said, oh, we need a parent too. And I looked at my wife like, uh, oh, really? Uh, uh, do you want to do? No, no. Who's going to do with this with them? And, you know, I have this little voice always because a lot of it has to do with just being a good parent and also engaging them in our language and engaging with them anyway, because I, I really want to <clears throat> make the most of our time together while they're children, even older children. And so that little voice said, Adam, just do it, you know, just, just do it. 
just do it. And so, you know, face your fears. But we all had the same fears, I think. But once we got up there and we realized, you know, we are connected, you know, we have a cable and we have a whole, you know, in a, we're in a holster connected to this cable. We can't really fall. But it's still, Amanda, it's terrifying. I mean, you're 30 meters up in the air moving from tree to tree in these very kind of scary ways that aren't really scary because you can't really fall, I don't think. Um, but we did not fall and we did manage to get through the whole course. And it was really a blast for all of us. So even though it was scary, particularly at first, it was quite a memorable experience for the three of us. Mm. And um, so anyway, yes, yes. So the, things like that do continue. Um, but I have to be more proactive about, um, you know, seeking out those opportunities, creating those opportunities. And when those opportunities arise, even if I didn't expect like having to go 30 meters up in the air in these trees, to accept them, to agree with them, to go with them. And so I'm glad I did and, um, and I'll hopefully continue to do so. Absolutely. So the playful, the fun, and also the uh, excitement for dad, I think it carries on with all the language learning and also, you know, relationship. I think actually we're talking about the bonding and the relationship. Right, right. So, so for the parents who actually, um, they are not here yet, like us, we already have a teenagers. So you actually have a book, you know, for yes. the babies, I want to be bilingual. And this book, I think is so precious is it's a very easy read. And I think it's something should be put on mom and dad's, you know, um, table, desk, you know, even on the bed, just to remind yourself, why, where did you um, get this idea? And to write for the baby, say, I really want to be bilingual. Well, it, it actually started in a way with the first book. I don't know if you have that handy, but it's Maximize Your Child's Bilingual Ability, which is a much bigger book. It's mm -hmm. like 310 pages um, about you know, all aspects really of raising a bilingual child and maximizing that child's bilingual or multilingual ability over the years of childhood. Uh, however, you know, after this book came out and, and I'm, I feel very gratified, it's very gratifying that parents all over the world have found this book to be um, helpful to them and empowering to them. And yet I know there are also many parents, particularly parents of uh, babies, young children who, who are very busy and tired and may not want to read a 310 page book. And so I wanted to bring together or boil down, you know, the essence of the bigger book. What are the most important things for parents to know about this? And so I did, I, I created this, this picture book and here it is again. I want to be bilingual, which is from the baby's point of view. And so the baby is talking to the parents about, I want to be bilingual and giving them advice about how to do that. And these are the main ideas in the bigger book about how to be successful at this larger, longer term challenge. And so the book, the book turned out really nicely. I'm really happy with it. The illustrator did a wonderful job with it too. And as it turns out, and I didn't think of this at the time, but not only parents have enjoyed it and, and found it informative and inspiring, but you know, if they already have small children, the small children have actually enjoyed it too. And they can talk about it together as a family. So it's really been an you know, it's a unique sort of book and it's hard to pin down. And I think when people see it, they immediately think it's only a picture book. Um, but it's kind of more than that. It's actually for parents, but also for families, for children as well. And the, I want to be bilingual. I have a soft spot for that book because I do want to create um, resources for parents that are engaging also in playful ways. We talk about being playful with our kids, but I want to be playful with parents in terms <laughs> of how to convey this kind of information because it's important information, but it's often presented in a much drier way. And so through my work over the years at my blog and at my forum and through these books, I, I really want to try to engage 
parents and families in playful ways that at the same time can convey this important information so they can be more successful in their bilingual or multilingual journey. Yes, I, um, if I may, I would like to read just one page um, from this book. I, first, I want to show everybody the very cute um, illustration. And then it says, and I want a pony too, but let's talk about that later. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I just think, you know, um, like you said, it's more than just a picture book because even when little kids, when they um, look at the pictures, and you know, it's a, it's like you have topics to talk about with your right. baby, no matter right. what language or target language you're working on. I right. think that's, that's something very important. And then you, you touch on something I, I feel, I totally feel very important. That's the um, self, kind of self-care of the parents. I think a parent mm. on this journey, it's a day-to-day, every day, a lot of emotional labor. So, yes. you know, being, care, uh, being playful, um, also to yourself as a parent, I think it's a way to recharge yourself on the journey. Absolutely. I agree. I mean, it's not easy to sustain. Any longer term aim is not easy to sustain, particularly if you feel discouraged sometimes. And everyone does. You know, not everything we do will be successful. Uh, so I think it's important going into this, though, to know that no one is perfect at this and we don't have to be perfect to still realize a lot of rewarding progress and longer term success over the years of childhood. So you don't have to be perfect, but what you do have to do is persevere and you persevere from day to day to day. And in those tougher days, you know, okay, you collapse and sit back and you're like, oh, it just, I just didn't do well today. I failed today. You know, it was miserable or whatever it was. But then you, you know, the next day you dust yourself off and you get back into the game. And again, you do the best you can. And when you need support, because of support is so essential for many parents, then you have that support. I mean, we're so fortunate that we can connect online in this way. And parents can go to my blog or they can go to my forum, which is the Bilingual Zoo Forum, which is a tremendous resource for parents. And it's free. It's a tremendous resource for parents to, to, to gain that sort of support and to feel that they're, they're part of a larger community of kindred spirits, right? And so, you know, feeling alone in this can be quite difficult. And that's part of the discouraging nature of this sometimes. But, you know, I tell parents, you're not alone. You don't have to be alone. Yes, you're alone to whatever extent your circumstances dictate in terms of your own efforts. You have to put in your own efforts from day to day and that you may be alone in a lot of that, but you don't have to be alone in terms of, you know, your support for this. And when you feel down or you feel discouraged. You, you just need to reach out and I'm always available. I mean, my email address is easy to find, you know, go to my blog or go to the forum. There's no excuse really to give up if it's really important to you. There's no excuse. You yeah. know, again, it's fine to be frustrated. It's fine to be, you know, even depressed for a short time about the progress that your children are making. But there's no excuse for giving up. I mean, the only way you can fail is to give up. I mean, if you continue from day to day, if you have daily persistence and long-term perseverance, ultimately you will succeed. You may not succeed to the point you were imagining at the very beginning, but you will reap a lot of rewarding success over the years. You just have to keep going. That's, that is uh, beautifully put. And then I think a lot of times, and, you know, people look at, you know, um, now their um, social media posts and things like that. A lot of people will post different things, or, you know, uh, look at the kids or reading fluently or, you know, doing different things. But a lot of times I, I want to remind parents is like, what you don't see is behind the scene. What are things the parents have been doing? You, what do you see probably just a result at that moment, but you don't know how much time this parent has put in to make this happen. Even, uh, you know, we've been 
constantly writing blog posts and things like that, but it's not like uh, our journal. But whatever we share is the um, a real story, what's happening. So just like Absolutely. you said, you can be Absolutely. very frustrated. You can feel like, oh, you didn't do a good job. But the thing is like, if you can come back tomorrow and say, I'm going to try it again. But you know, every day trying again, it's one little step forward. Exactly. So, that's what exactly. I parents should, should you know, can keep yeah, going. It's a very long journey. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And it continues with every little step after that, right? Yes. So, you know, what you say about, you know, what happens behind the scenes. I mean, I guess I've tried to do that over the years. I've been blogging for eight years and the Maximize Your Child's Bilingual Ability book came out four years ago. I think just it came out probably just prior to our conversation four years ago. But you know, in both the blog and in, in the book and in the forum as well, I've tried to share, you know, the whole wide ranging, um, the wide range of experiences I've had, both good and not necessarily bad, but more frustrating experiences in terms of my own journey. And, and I share that for what it's worth. You know, there are 400 plus blog posts at my blog. I'm not sure everyone's gonna read all those anymore, but the point is, you know, that sort of experience is available if parents have the time and the w inclination to seek it out. And I would just add actually that at the Bilingual Zoo Forum, if parents are really interested in what the day-to-day -day reality is like, just go to the Track Your Progress board because there are many parents that started their own thread about their experience, about their journey, and they have continued updating their threads over time, over the past several years even, and there are dozens and dozens, even hundreds and hundreds of posts that parents have made, which chronicles their journey. And so, you know, look at the Track Your Progress board at the Bilingual Zoo, and you'll get a real, uh, a real taste of yeah. what it's like to raise a bilingual and multilingual child from day to day, from week to week, from month to month, from year to year. Yes, I, I think we'll kind of touch on that. Um, um, one time when we had a conversation, we said, we're still here. A lot of people probably, we don't know where they are when we first started. So um, right. we started about the same time, I, I think, you know. Um, right. So it's really interesting to see that. So having the community really makes a difference. So uh, Bilingual Zoo, don't forget, you know, to take a take a look and you know, join the forum and then be a part of the community. That will make things um, definitely easier. At least you know you're not alone, even though you're Absolutely. not together with the, the other pair, fellow parents, but right. you know you have a community there, uh, the community there to ask questions. I, I think, and then, you know, every child is very unique. So whatever works for one child doesn't mean that it will work for this child. So you need to have different kind of uh, information and also a lot of uh, testing at, at the same time, but go with something your child is interested in. I think that is always a good start. Sure, um, sure. One one question. What we talk about, you know, so many things. You know, we talk okay. about the, the 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 little kids. You know how parents should do the community. And okay, let's go back to your bilingual parenting journey again. Okay. Um, do you have anything you, you know we can celebrate with you? You know, um, and uh, let us know something we can celebrate with you because I know you you kind of mentioned earlier about the speech contest. Yeah, tell tell a little bit more about it uh, with us. Uh, well, let's see. Um, you know, I, I, I was, it was tongue in cheek when I just said I survived, but you know, it feels kind of like that to get to this point where I think the most rewarding thing, at least at the moment, is that, and I mentioned this before, that we've gotten to a place where the kids have a firm and active foundation in the minority language that is sustainable. Okay. And so, you know, I don't want to say my job is done, but I think that's the main part of the job, you know, and so I think I've managed that. And, so, you know, at this point, there are many things looking back that I would celebrate uh, in particular, and I was reminded of this, like I said, during the 
the pandemic when the schools were closed because it was this brief flashback to these younger years when I spent so much more time with them and we did so many creative things together, making videos together and, you know, playing many more games and, you know, my blogging at the time was really active because I was actively involved in their their day-to-day -day lives and I was trialing so many different things with them too but um, yeah I mean more recently last year I mentioned the speech contest and I'm sure that's something that both my daughter and I will look back on in, in years to come because we spent a lot of time together um, preparing for that and I, I wanted her to do the best she could of course um, and when she puts her mind to it and when she wants something, she really has a very strong will and a strong work ethic. She'll really work hard at it. And as it turns out, I mean, that all paid off and she was, she won first place, not only in the city of Hiroshima, but in the whole Hiroshima prefecture, which is like our state. And so that contest, I'll never forget because when she, this is even before they announced the winners, uh, when the judges were conferring, but after she was very nervous, but she did such a good job presenting her speech and really communicated it well. And I was very proud of her. And then during that little break when the judges were conferring about the winners, you know, she didn't know if she had won anything or not, but she was so happy. She was beaming and she was down, you know, close to the stage. And my wife and I were back in the auditorium and she came up the aisle towards me and gave me a big hug, which doesn't happen very often anymore. And she was like, thank you. And, you know, that was so touching to me and something I won't forget. And then, you know, the gravy on top of that was the fact that she, she won the big trophy uh, for the contest. Um, and so that was a really, really special moment for us, I think. And for my son, it would be at the moment this, this coloring book, which you already showed, now let's and just show I'll everybody show again. Yeah. Yes, there it is. And so, whoa, oh, it's okay. whoa, here we go. Yes. Yeah, so anyway, that, that, it started before the pandemic in a way, because um, after we got this, this very cute creature, and I wish I could show her to you. She's in her little home right now in the other room, but uh, maybe next time. But anyway, uh, so my my son and I, or, or probably it was my son actually, who asked at one point, because they're very, again, sweet and gentle creatures, but they do a lot of sitting and kind of, you know, they sit and bask with this heat lamp. Mm -hmm. And they she sits on her big rock and she's basking in her heat lamp, just kind of being off into the distance like she's, you know, daydreaming. And my son asked at one point, you know, what is she thinking? You know, is she thinking at all? What, what's going on in her little mind? And from that point, we started thinking about this funny idea. We thought it was a funny idea where we would come up with these daydreams. What is she daydreaming about, right? And it was one of those ideas where you don't really expect to pursue it. You know, you're busy with your own lives and he was in school at the time and things like that. But when we had, suddenly the schools are closed for nearly three months. And then I thought, okay, well, what can we do together? We, we have more time together now, what can we do? And I picked that back up and I said, why don't we do this? You know, why don't we actually create this idea? We can realize this together. And, I, and at first I thought, he's quite a good artist. And I thought maybe he would like to actually do the illustrations as well, but he didn't want to pursue it that far. And so we brought in an illustrator uh, that I know who did a marvelous job with this. And my son and I came up with the concepts for the illustrations. And so it, it shows the bearded dragon in 30 different illustrations, um, what the bearded dragon is daydreaming about. So like on the cover, you can see he has this very blank look on his face, you know, daydreaming, staring off in the distance. But what is he thinking about? It's this contrast. He's at the amusement park and he's, <laughs> he's with his, 
his boy owner, right? And they're in the roller coaster together. So that's what the book is all about. And it's really taken off, particularly among the, the bearded dragon community out there in the world. <laughs> um, and we actually have now too, a, a pretty popular um, bearded dragon page at Instagram. Uh, if you search for Bearded Dragon Daydreams, which is the name of the coloring book, you'll also find uh, our page at Instagram. And it's got a bunch of fun stuff on it. It's not all related just to the coloring book, um, but the illustrator is actually helping us with that page too. And anyway, I recommend taking a look. It's a lot of fun. And if you'd like to pick up a copy of the coloring book, that would be great. And the thing is, it's not just about coloring, but it's also about language. And I included, intentionally, I included a page of ideas for parents. Uh, Can you share some with us? Because I oh, read those, I, I thought it was great. Can you just, well, yeah, you know, a yeah, highlight, hi yeah, a few ideas highlights. for parents because, and it's not just for this coloring book, it could be, useful for any coloring book or any sort of imagery. But the idea is how can you milk these images in ways that are, are, are productive for your uh, language learning uh, aim, right? And so you can talk about each image with your child. You can really get into some detail. And this is no different from a picture book, let's say. But you can really talk about the images with the children. And as the children get older, you can write things on the back of the paper, for example. You know, maybe the child can write something simple. Or you can, the child can dictate to you what they would like to say about it. And I know uh, families, some bilingual and multilingual families, have been using this coloring book in that way. And so I'm really happy about that as well. So it's not only just a fun activity book, but it's actually a language learning resource if you view it in that way and take advantage of it in that way. Right. I, I, for me, I also think this is almost like a family activity book. If we just uh, look at one page, because if we, you know, if you look at the details, you know, you can talk about Who's this? You know, what sure. is he wearing? What is he playing? What's on the ball? So you are actually creating a story with your child, the way you and your child, you know, create your own story with the pictures. And of course, what is he thinking? Is that really what he's <laughs> thinking? Uh, she, Fima, you know, is so cute, right? So I think this is adorable. So I think a lot of times when we look at um, resources, I think this is a resource that can be using different languages, of course, you know. Yeah, and any language at, at all. Yeah, there's no language required in no. terms of the language given to you. You can use it in any language you want. And so it's just another way, you know, this is one example of being as creative and resourceful as we can about our day-to-day -day lives in terms of the resources we come across. And so whether it's this coloring book or another coloring book or any other imagery you come across uh, in your daily life with your children, milk those images uh, for the benefit of your children's language development. Right. I mean, we both love stories. Well, by the way, we both just really into stories, no matter, you know, especially in um, the, the language acquisition. And we just think it's, it's very important, you know, so use all the resources you have, you know, um, for example, Adam's book, One More Time, you know, Beard of Dragon here, you know, just <laughs> look at all the pages. Just so cute. It's, here, it's just the little boys will be, you know, like, oh, this is so fun. You know, there's so many things you can talk about. I think that's one thing. And also, um, we know that, you know, um, the it is bilingual parenting is the ever evolving journey. And then wow. I know in addition to English and Japanese for your kids, you actually have a new book. It's a Spanish and English bilingual stories. And why Spanish? Is this something your kids are learning as well? Here we go. This just came out recently. It's called 28 Bilingual English Spanish Fairy Tales and Fables. And it's, it's not a picture book. It's a language learning resource. So it has, at least the paperback has the English on one side, and the Spanish on the other side. These are dual facing pages. The ebook is very similar, of course. Um, and so, yes, I think at least it goes back to about five years ago when 
two things were happening. I wrote the stories in English a long time ago, and I was sharing them only in English uh, with parents who had English as the target language. Uh, and at roughly the same time, I guess, um, we met a woman from Spain who lives in Hiroshima with her Japanese husband. And, and I said, you know, would you be interested in teaching my kids Spanish, maybe a couple times a month coming to our home and seeing if we can, you know, make some progress over time. And that's what's happened. I mean, the pandemic has made that more difficult now and my kids are older and they have less time, but I've tried to sustain that over the past five years or so, even though I don't have much Spanish myself. So um, their teacher has been coming to our house. And at the same time, I've tried to, through various textbooks, workbooks, other kinds of resources, trying to, you know, advance their exposure to Spanish a little bit day by day by day. And so they have really made some progress over time. It's definitely their third language, right? It's not active to the extent that the Japanese and, and English are. However, so anyway, uh, I had the English stories and some Spanish experience, and I finally decided, well, you know, let's, let's bring this together into a new book, which I think could be very helpful for not only parents raising children with English and or Spanish as the target language, but with these stories at this, at this simple level, I call them short, simple stories for language learners of all ages, with online audio. So it can be used with kids, but certainly with teens or adults as well, because it's really at just a, uh, a simple, a, so a short and simple uh, level for any sort of language learner. And it also does have online audio. So you have the text, uh, whether that's the paperback or the ebook, and then you can also access the audio files online. So all the stories have been narrated uh, by a bilingual, professional bilingual voice artist who did a, a really wonderful job. And so those stories can be, the audio can be accessed and you can take advantage of that as well. So it's a nice little package, I think, for uh, families uh, with children who have English and or Spanish as a target language, but also beyond that for teens and adults. And, and I, I, I hope it can be very helpful to many people out in the world. So the, your selection of those 28 stories, can you just name, name a few? Because I think a lot of kids, they probably already have the background knowledge of that. So taking that to either English or Spanish, I think that is really a very nice learning tool. Yeah, so I, I did try to find stories that were familiar, or many of them are familiar, that could be written in a simple way on one page. So every story is on one page. Um, so it starts with the three little pigs and the Spanish is los tres cerditos, my Spanish accent is poor, and then the lion and the mouse, el león y el raton, like that, and it goes on and on and on, the gingerbread man, Cinderella, the ugly duckling, Goldilocks and the three bears, uh, the boy who cried wolf, so it's a, a pretty wide selection of fairy tales and fables that uh, many people are already familiar with and that can already help you understand the story if you already have some background knowledge of it, right? Right. And so then it becomes an easier entry in terms of um, engaging with the story in a different language. Totally. And I think the, the fun thing is this book can be used, you know, even when the kids are little, parents can read to the kids. And then when the kids are a little bit older, they can probably start reading on their own. So it's, sure. uh, it's something, you know, with a pretty wide range of, uh, you know, the age group you can apply to. So I, I, I think, think so. that's great. Yeah. And, and in the beginning of the book, like in the coloring book, I offer in this book, I offer a couple pages of ideas on how it can be used, right? How can you make the most of this book um, in different sorts of circumstances, whether you're a parent of a, of a child or whether you're a teacher in a classroom, you know, and you're working with children or teens or even adults. I mean, it could be self-study, a self-study resource for adults too. So 
um, there are some ideas for how to make use of the book as well. So we're um, coming back to another question. A lot of the, a lot of times the parents encounter. We kind of talk about a little bit about that. You know, the frustration parents might have. And then one thing a lot of parents come to talk to me or ask me questions is about resistance. What to do when you encounter resistance? You know, on the bilingual parenting journey. <laughs> It's a great question. I mean, it's hard to answer in a specific way because I think specifics can only be applied to specific circumstances, right? And so when a parent, and I, I do a lot of consulting as well online in particular, I've done it in person as well. It's of course easier to connect with parents online uh, around the world these days. And so I'm able in those consulting sessions to offer specific suggestions or advice that can target, you know, their particular children in their particular circumstances. So that said, in general, in terms of resistance, I think what needs to happen though is persistence, but playful persistence. I mean, you keep at it, you just keep at it. You don't let that discourage you and derail your dream in any way. I mean, you, it's fine to feel um, discouraged or upset or any of the other sorts of negative emotions, that's fine. But those emotions should serve you in a positive way. And what I mean by that is that you shouldn't let them get out of hand to the point where it does derail your motivation and your efforts. You have to let those frustrations be something that gets you going, even makes you more determined, you know? How do I overcome this? What do I do now? And, you know, a lot of this is trial and error again, but if you can't quite figure things out on your own, that's when you reach out to other people, right? What can I do? What do you guys think? Or Adam, you know, this is my situation. Do you have any suggestions for me? You know, whether that's through a text or an email or whether it's through a, an hour long consultation, right? But it's that sense of being playfully persistent from day to day and persevering for the long term. So I think I, I can try to be a little more specific, at least about my own situation, um, at least at this point. Um, of course, I've experienced resistance from time to time, but my own counsel to myself, if you will, has always been just stay playful and persistent about it. Just continue to be um, not playful to the point where I'm not being firm about it. I don't want to give the impression that I'm not firm at the same time. You know, I am very playful because that's my nature. You know, I, I want it to be playful and fun and joyful for everyone because if it's not, you know, it's, we're not succeeding, even if our children are progressing. If it's not joyful for us, I mean, that should be the barometer for every family. It should be basically, at least for the most part, fun and enjoyable. But at the same time, we do have to be firm and serious about our expectations for our children's, um, our children's, uh, our children's, what am I trying to say? their willingness to continue engaging with us and with the language, right? Yes. And, but at the same time, we have to find ways that are lighthearted about that, that can connect with the children's interests, as you, you stressed earlier, and that's a way in, and that's a way we, we can continue moving forward, right? So these days, you know, my kids have much less time, as I said, and so, Every day, I continue to give them a little bit of homework in English, our target language. I've done that ever since they were like three years old. I mean, this has gone on the, the whole way through. I can't do as much of that because they just don't have as much time and they have a lot of homework every day. And I'm at this point still more successful at doing this with my son than I am with my daughter because she's so busy and then she tends to push the English stuff off until after she completes her Japanese homework, or she does have some English homework from school too, which is helpful. Um, but then, you know, the book I give her to read this chapter today, um, then she sets it aside and doesn't do it. But, you know, the thing is, I accept that because we're at a place where 
I'm confident that it's okay. It's mm -hmm. not a threat. If I step back now and did nothing else, it would still be okay. And I would be okay with that. Okay. So we're at that place where uh, I'm confident that there is that sustainability. However, I still will continue to be playfully persistent from day to day, and I will continue assigning them things in English, particularly when they have more time, but when they're not able to do it, I'm, I'm still, I'm more understanding about it, right? So I think in terms of resistance, the resistance is understandable to me. It's not the kind of resistance I might have had earlier when she was five years old and she didn't really do a very good job with the homework I was giving her. She was really sloppy about it or, you know, there was certain resistance going on and I was more firm about it. And I could be more firm at the time, you know, and slap my hand down on the desk in some, you know, occasionally I would do that. But I was being firm, you know, but that's balanced with this general sense of being playful and loving about our interactions, right? So I, I think we have to lead with love and continue to be playful uh, and yet continue to be uh, persistent and firm about our expectations moving forward. Because if we don't get that balance right, and it's an ongoing challenge, frankly, but we have to be very serious about our, our aim, but also very playful about how we approach our efforts towards um, cultivating that aim over time that that is true i mean we want to be playful and we want to have fun but at the same time i think we need to make sure things are moving forward and the only thing you can do and should do is day to day the daily effort yeah that's the most important part maybe that's why i have all the chocolate mms you know candy <laughs> corn <laughs> i understand and, you know, Amanda, also that's where, you know, we talked about projects before. So it's the day to day. And then on top of that, it's special projects that might be special short term creative projects that we can pursue with our kids. And it's also, you know, when we have a chance for more immersion type experiences, whether that's locally, um, we, we can place them in some sort of extracurricular activity, or we can have someone coming into our home that speaks the target language, that can engage with our children, that there are additional things we can do beyond our own efforts. And then, of course, that can, we can really boost our efforts by traveling to the to locations where the minority language is actually the majority language and our children can get those immersion experiences that can i mean that can really really support um, the efforts we're making at home so it's everything we do from day to day and then beyond that you know what special things we can do that may involve our efforts or by bringing in other speakers of the language whether that's locally or online and then if we have the opportunity to spend more time to spend you know extended periods of time to extend you know lengthy visits as long as we can in these countries so our children can be immersed in the language and the culture to the extent possible because so many families have benefited so tremendously from those experiences even if they feel like they're kind of struggling at home from day to day those travel experiences can be such uh, a booster shot I I, that's what i'm going to say it's such a boost i mean totally totally exactly. i totally agree exactly. yeah yeah, the, the, the boost. I, I know it's, it's extensive. Uh, right now, the traveling is kind of uh, uh, challenging yeah. because the pandemic. But I think at the same time, I think my kids, you know, before the summer, they were asking, are we, well, will we be able, you know, to go go to Taipei, for example, you know, to visit the grandparents and the things we couldn't. And uh, what I did, you know, was like doing something, you know, virtually, you know, so they were able to, you know, have their own summer camp. And that was quite interesting, actually. Sure, sure. And then at the same time, I think parents now, I think, you know, easier than before because of online environment, you know, yeah. the world is so small. There are so many resources. Right. I think it's just, I need to be a little bit creative to create um, that kind of environment for, for the kids, as a matter of fact. Yeah. 
So Adam, you, you talk about consulting. I think, you know, you have a consulting service for families, you know, who are on this bilingual family journey or the multilingual family journey. Can you touch on that and to share with our uh, audience and listeners? Right. I mean, I've, I've done this over the years and I was doing it um, through my own website for a while privately uh, and charging a fee for that service. Uh, recently, however, it's very interesting and I'm not sure how long this will last, but for now, um, I've been working with Habelnet and Habelnet is a new organization um, and Habelnet stands for the Harmonious Bilingual uh, Network. And Habelnet is able to provide consulting for free for parents. And there are a team of experts and they asked me to be on the team. And so Habelnet is covering the fee for the consultants and parents are able to take advantage of these uh, consultations without charge. So they need to, if they would like to speak to me or another expert, they would uh, go to Havelnet and, and find the consultation service. And then they can put in their information. If they would like to speak to me, they could mention my name. And uh, whether or not they're actually, Havelnet is able to assign uh, the person to me, it really depends on the situation at the time. However, you know, that preference can be made. More specifics about that actually can be found at the Bilingual Zoo. I do have a page about the, the process of requesting a free consultation. So if you go to the Bilingual Zoo, I think you'd easily find that page of information and just follow those steps. And if you would like to speak to me, then, then it's, a, it's a real possibility. So uh, again, um, you know, for the future, I don't know. Um, their their arrangement may change, you know, who knows? I mean, life goes on and, and our lives, uh, you know, change too. So, but now, you know, uh, for, for the moment and for the foreseeable future, uh, it's a really special opportunity, I think, for parents to speak to me or another consultant personally about their situation um, for free. Okay, well, I'll include the, um, the link in the show notes so uh, parents can take a look. And so, Adam, it has been a wonderful conversation. So do you have any other encouraging words for parents who are already on the journey? And, um, <laughs> you know, and the, the truth, the roadmap, you know, what's the most important thing they should embrace? Perseverance, you just have to keep going. I mentioned this before, but that's the main thing because even if you don't know what you're doing and most people don't going in, right? You have, you, it's a new experience and you have a new baby too. There's just so much, it feels overwhelming sometimes. I understand that. You just need to persevere though because day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, it will all add up over time. You just need to keep going and provide, I mean, the build, the basic building blocks of progress and success are ample language exposure. There's not many, there are not too many things that are universal about this experience, but language exposure is, I mean, without that and without a lot of that, the child can't learn any language, right? So that's imperative. That's, that's pivotal. And then, so exposure and then need. The child, in most cases, needs to feel some kind of genuine need to use the language actively mm -hmm. with the minority language parent or, or other people as well. So always go back to those two. Those are your building blocks and how you handle it may be different than another family and that's perfectly fine because you need to tailor how you address these two things, exposure and need, to your particular circumstances and your particular aim. Um, so exposure and need and perseverance, you have those three things, you will succeed. And when you feel discouraged, reach out and say, help, help, you know, I need it, not only a helping hand, but maybe I just need someone to say, you can do it. And I will say, you can do it. So, you know, I think Amanda, at this point, we both know that Everybody can do it. Yes. Uh, it does take uh, a real commitment and yes. it does take daily efforts, but you know, the days 
quickly bleed into the years. And finally, you get to a point again, more quickly than you imagine when your children are teenagers. And finally, you can say, you know, I've, I've done the best I could, you know, it, what I did was good enough. And my kids have really gotten to a place where they can continue this journey on their own. And then again, you know, we can lie in our hammock and we can finally have a, a drink and, and read the paperbacks <laughs> that we couldn't read for the past 18 years. <laughs> anyway, Amanda, it was great to talk to you again. I look forward to talking to you again in four more years. Yes. Our kids are out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about one more time. Well, when you are frustrated, I think you should always have this book in hand because this definitely will, you know, um, kind of make you smile and uh, light things up. And don't forget, here's another book, the coloring book, Bearded Dragon, Daydreams, the coloring book. And there's another one, Adam. Oh, yeah, there it is. Maximize your child's bilingual ability. Love it. And, and the new language learning resource is 28 Bilingual English, Spanish, fairy tales and fables. Muchas gracias, and Adam. <laughs> yeah. Thank you and thanks to everybody out there for all your support over the years. It's been a tremendous uh, journey, a tremendous adventure, both for me and my family and for everyone I've come into contact with over the years. Thank Where you. can our audience and listeners find you? Well, of course, Bilingual Monkeys, the blog is still there after eight years. Uh, the forum, the Bilingual Zoo is still there. Uh, again, who knows you know, how much longer, uh, but I'll, for the foreseeable future, I'll keep at it. Um, and you can find me at Facebook and Twitter and now at Instagram too. As I said, the Bearded Dragon Daydreams Instagram page is a lot of fun. And my publishing imprint is called Bilingual Adventures. And so if you're at Instagram, also check out Bilingual Adventures because I do post things there from time to time as well. Thank you so much, Adam. I'll see you again soon. Yes, yes, very good. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you, Bye take care. Now.